I'm going to invite you to take a seat, and as you're taking a seat, take a Bible or Bible app and turn to Jonah chapter 3. Jonah chapter 3 is our text today as we're continuing our series on Jonah. Uh, If you don't have a Bible with you, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 921, and you will find Jonah chapter 3 right there. And as always, if you're here and you don't have a Bible and you want one, then please take one of these with you. This is our gift to you. We want you to have the Word of God, read the Word of God, because we know if you do that, God will change your lives. Uh, So uh, just, and some people, uh, they never stop. They kind of go, are you sure that I can really take one of these? Yes, we're sure. Okay? We want you to have God's Word. Hey, uh, I'm really excited about Easter. Uh, It's three weeks away, and uh, and I just, I'm excited because I love to celebrate the resurrection of Christ. Uh, I love it that, uh, you know, people make it a priority to worship that weekend, and we have a lot of fun, and we do great things, so uh, I'm just excited about that, but uh, I, I'm excited about the Passion Experience, too, but because we're doing the Passion, passion Experience, it means that we got to kind of have a break on baptisms for a couple of weeks, and I know some of you are like, you know, mulling over this idea of, I, I got to express my faith in Christ in baptism, and you haven't done it yet, and if you're kind of thinking about that, can I just uh, encourage you to consider Easter? as a day to uh, declare your faith publicly in baptism. Uh, and, and here's the reason, and, and I'm, I'm just being selfish in this. Uh, we're going to have lots of guests on Easter. And, and when we have lots of guests, it's a great way for you to declare to them that Jesus Christ has changed your life. And, and they get to see that, not just hear me talk about it. So uh, if you want to be part of the, the message that weekend, then, then by all means, uh, you know, let us know that this is something you'd like to do, and we'd love to schedule that. The other thing, I'm just going to go ahead and mention that. I plan on talking about it next week, but I'm just going to go ahead and, and get you guys thinking about it this week. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed it, but it's kind of crowded in here, right? Do you guys notice that? Do you pay attention? The parking lot might be a little bit crowded. Seating is definitely crowded. People can't find seats and stuff like that. And I praise God for that. Uh, but uh, for Easter, that's a little bit of a problem, Right? You guys are like going, how early can we get here? We have a service before this one. Now, so uh, I'm just going to, next week we'll talk about it more, but uh, for Easter weekend, three weeks away, I'm I'm really just going to ask about half of you to come on Saturday. Uh, And uh, and I'm I'm telling you that now because I know that you love Jesus enough to give up your seat for people who don't know him like you do. And uh, and so you guys start having that conversation in your life groups and in your families and just kind of go, hey, could we do... Could we do a Saturday on Easter weekend so that people who don't know God could maybe come and worship and find a place to sit and stuff like that? So I'm just throwing that out there because I know your guys' hearts, and I know you guys' hearts are for people, so uh, I'm just going to mention that since I mentioned Easter. Hey, we're looking at Jonah. We're in the series on Jonah. We're talking about this guy, Jonah, this prophet of God. He's got this little book in the Old Testament. You found it by now, page 921. And, uh, And some of you know this story really well, and some of you are familiar with it, and some of you have never read it before, Uh, and that's okay. Uh, But let me just kind of cover what we know. We're on chapter 3 today, but let me tell you about chapters 1 and 2 in case you missed it. Chapter 1, Jonah is a prophet of God. God says, go to this country called Nineveh, the city called Nineveh, and I want you to tell them that I'm going to judge them. I'm going to destroy their city if they don't repent. And and Jonah doesn't want to go. doesn't like the Ninevites. He actually hates them, so he goes the opposite direction. Never a good idea to go the opposite direction of what God's telling you to do uh, because you're just inviting a storm in your life. Jonah had a a real storm, like serious storm. Uh, He was on a boat, and they couldn't uh, get through the storm, freaking out. Uh, He admits, hey, it's my fault. Storm is my fault. I'm disobeying God. Uh, Throw me overboard. Finally, they throw him overboard. Storm calms down, and it looks like Jonah's going to die, except God actually saves Jonah in the grossest way possible. He has a giant fish swallow him. See, sometimes we don't really like how God saves us, but he does it anyway. And, um, and that's chapter one. Chapter two is Jonah repenting, because what would you do if a giant fish swallowed you? Right? He finally admits, God, I was wrong. I'm sorry. I praise you. I want to serve you. I want to do whatever you ask me to do. <laughs> that's a great commitment to make when you're in the belly of a fish. And so the chapter ends by uh, God, you know, giving Jonah a second chance by the fish, vomiting him out on the beach. And you thought you had a bad week. And so we pick up in chapter 3 of Jonah, because a lot of us grew up in, you know, vacation Bible school and Sunday school, and, and that was where the story always ended. It doesn't end there. It's only halfway over at that point. Jonah chapter 3, verse 1 says, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I will tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. 
Now, Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. And Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh, by the decree of the king and the nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. This chapter tells the story of an amazing miracle. Just an incredible event. I mean, it, it, a miracle is almost an understatement. The, the Ninevites, they were Assyrians. They were the greatest empire of the world at the time. And they were known for their fierce cruelty and their unrelenting will. And yet, in this short chapter, we see the miracle unfold. Now, the miracle begins because Jonah proclaims. Verse 4, Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now, that doesn't sound like a great sermon, really, but Jonah finally accepts the calling of God and faithfully, if reluctantly, delivers the warning of judgment. And he must have been a strange sight. I mean, can you imagine? Here's a Jewish prophet in the capital city of the Assyrians, yeah, the Assyrians had conquered uh, the Israelites. They destroyed the northern kingdom. The southern kingdom paid them tribute, uh, submitted to them. And, and here he is, a Jewish prophet, walking through Nineveh, this great city, smelling like fish guts and whale puke. Ah. And then you have, we have no idea what he looked like. Maybe, you know, the enzymes in the, in the stomach of the fish had bleached him out. And he was all white. Maybe he had seaweed wrapped in his hair because he's like, I don't care. If I have to go to Nineveh, I'm not going to take a bath. So basically, there he is, a freak show on the streets of Nineveh. But he was obedient to what God asked him to do. He was obedient to God. And so Jonah proclaims, and then the people repent. She catches verse 5. It's so short, so simple, and yet so amazing. And the people of Nineveh believed God. And they called for a fast and put on sackcloth. Uh, we're talking burlap here. Because most of us don't have sackcloth clothes, right? You guys remember burlap sacks, stuff like that? Not exactly the kind of stuff you want next to your skin. Uh, but they put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least. The people believe God. They repented. I mean, all the way from the king to the animals. I, I mean, think about how just absolutely amazing this is. I mean, this is the most powerful king on the earth, and he takes off his silk robes, and he puts on these burlap clothes, and he sits in ashes because that's a sign of repentance. He refuses to eat, and he prays to the God of a conquered nation. He prays to the God of a conquered nation, a nation that they have defeated militarily, and, and, and that is repentance. It is faith demonstrated in action. He tells everybody, hey, we're going to do this. We're going to pray to God, and we're going to stop the evil that's in our hands. We're going to put away the violence. We're going to change our behavior because we're going to call out to God so he won't destroy us. That's repentance. It's faith in action. I got to pick up on something that Pastor O.C. said last week as he preached about chapter 2 and about repentance. And that is this. Regret is not repentance. Regret is how we feel when we're sorry, when we've done something wrong and, we, and we're sorry about it. But repentance is the actions that change our behavior, that change what we're doing. 
And a lot of times we don't really make that connection because it's really easy to come to church and, and to feel regret. Oh, I blew it this week. I did something. And, and, we, and yes, God forgives us and we feel, feel better. And then we walk out these doors and we do exactly the same things that we were doing before. We go right back to our addictions. We go right back to our habits. We go right back to the destructive patterns in our lives that, that made us regret in the first place. Regret is regret and repentance is repentance. And I grew up in churches that were really good at regret. And I grew up in churches that had altar calls all the time. And we had altar calls Sunday morning, Sunday night, sometimes on Wednesday night. I mean, we were always wanting people to come to the altar. And, and people came to the altar, and a lot of times they would come and weep at the altar. And, and, and they, would, uh, they, they said they repented, but what they demonstrated was regret. And they would get up, and they'd walk out, and they'd live exactly the same way the rest of the week. So uh, I didn't like that, and then God made me a pastor. So we don't do altar calls very often here at Calvary. Why? Why don't we do them? Because honestly, I'm not preaching so that you will feel better. I'm preaching so that you will live better. The gospel is not about us feeling better. The gospel is about us living better because Jesus Christ changes our lives and we change our actions. And here's what I know. If you live better, you will feel better. But so many of us want to feel a certain way. I had a guy ask me one time, he says, don't you want people weeping at the altar? And, and honestly, I think I crushed him when I said, nope. <laughs> nope, don't care. He's like, don't you want people weeping? Hey, by the way, if you need to come weep at the altar, that's fine. We've got great members of our prayer team. They're faithful. They're spiritual. They will pray with you. They will weep with you. Uh, and not just in the morning. They'll continue all week long to pray for you. They, they have a great ministry. They're available after every single service. We have pastors at the Connection Centers that will talk with you and pray with you uh, after every single service. We want you to make a decision to follow Christ. We want your life to be different, but we're not focusing on how you feel. We're focusing on how you live. And so that guy, when he said, don't you want people weeping at the altar? I said, no, I don't. I, I want people walking out of here with changed lives for Jesus Christ. Living differently because that will bless you and that will bless your family and that will bless this community. The people of Nineveh repented. They demonstrated their faith in action. And then God shows mercy. God shows mercy. In verse 10, it says he relented of what he had planned, the destruction that he had planned. God sees their act of repentance and withholds his judgment. God shows grace and mercy to an evil city filled with evil people because they repented. Wow. Now, just for the record, you know, uh, that was uh, grace and mercy for a season because they went back to their ways and, and eventually they were conquered and overthrown and, and they're not still the like, greatest nation in the world anymore. You see, this is an amazing miracle, and it's evidence of God's power working through his servants, even his reluctant, unenthusiastic servants, because we know how Jonah felt about Nineveh. And so this account of Jonah makes it clear that God is in the business of life change. God's in the business of life change. This is what he's all about. This is what he wants to do in your life and my life. We see it in, in the story of, of Jonah and the people of Nineveh. That he changed their lives. We see it throughout the Gospels. You know, read the stories of Jesus. And you see Jesus healing lepers and paralytics and blind men. And, and, you, and you see Jesus, you know, ca casting out demons and giving people their lives back. You see it in Jesus raising the dead and calling the apostles to leave their fishing business and their tax booths to follow him. You see it in Jesus forgiving the adulterous woman and, and then setting her off to, to start a new life. God is in the business of changing lives. And God has the power to redeem anyone. God has the power to redeem anyone. Uh, do you believe that God can really change anyone's life? Great, 25 people right here do. Now, this is really, this is a significant question because whether or not we believe that really determines how we live our lives. Because growing up in church, I, I you know, I, I heard it preached that God could change anybody. But then again, you'd talk to people about, hey, why don't you invite so-and-so to church? And you know what they'd say? They'd say things like this. That's the last person you would ever see in church. 
You ever, anyone ever hear that statement? They're the last person you'd ever seen in church? Okay. I, I just got it for, the, for fun. How many of you were the last person they'd ever see in church? Okay, a lot of you held your hands up, but you didn't hold them up. Hold them up really high. How many of you were the last person you'd ever seen in church? Look around. See how many of those are in this room? That's evidence of God's power to change lives. See, God can redeem anybody. And, and we got to remember that. we got to think about that. God has the power to change any life. It doesn't matter where you've been or what you've done. It doesn't matter if you've murdered, stolen, assaulted, abused, or been in prison. It doesn't matter if you've been involved in pornography or prostitution or embezzlement or drug trafficking. God has the power to change any life. He can redeem anyone. Which means that God has the power to change your life. Let's make it personal. Because, you know, we can talk about God can redeem anybody. And some of you are thinking, God can redeem anybody but me. And the truth is, God can redeem anyone, even you. You are not beyond the hope or the grace of Jesus. He can change your life, your circumstances, your situation, who you are from the inside out, so that you live differently, act differently, are a whole new person. Uh, Listen to the Apostle John. Uh, His first letter, first chapter, he says this, but if we, followers, we walk in the light as Jesus is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, God's son, cleanses us of all our sin. That's kind of cool, isn't it? The blood of Jesus cleanses us of all our sin. Now, if we say that we have no sin, he goes on to say, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. You want to argue that you're a good person and you don't need to be forgiven by God? He says you're lying to yourself. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us or purify us of all unrighteousness. God has the power to change anybody's life. So I'm going to ask you this. Have you experienced God's life-changing power has God forgiven you of your sins has God redeemed your life personal because 2 Corinthians 5 17 says if anyone is in Christ he is a new creation new creation the old things have passed away all things are made new so if you want a new life in Jesus Christ you can have one Jesus will give it to you It begins, this journey begins when we confess and we commit, when when we simply acknowledge that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world. That we believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sins and was raised from the dead. And we make a commitment, a personal commitment to follow Jesus with our lives. It, It really just boils down to this. If you've never come to that place where you say, Jesus, I surrender to you. I need you to be the king of my life. Do it now. You don't need to wait for a pastor to walk you through it. You don't need the the prayer team to to make it happen. You just need to surrender to him. Give him your life. He knows if you mean it. He knows if you're serious. He sees your heart. He understands your heart. And and he wants to be the king of your heart. And and if you do make that commitment today, then please, by all means, see one of us after the service. See a pastor after the service because we want to throw a party and celebrate with you. And maybe talk about getting baptized on Easter. Uh, But uh, just... Just saying, that'd be cool, wouldn't it? You see, God has the power to redeem anyone. We need to know that. We need to understand that. We need to believe that because it will change our lives. And if you're a follower of Jesus, then we have the responsibility to represent Jesus. Jonah got into trouble because he didn't really want the task that God gave him. But God sent Jonah to Nineveh and said, go and tell them that, uh, who I am. And God has sent us on a mission as well. See, I believe that God has sent us on a mission to the people of Lake Havasu City. Because Jesus said to his followers, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. And guess what? I'm going to be with you always, even to the end of the age. So God has sent us, and where are we? We're in Lake Havasu City. This is our mission field. So if you're a follower of Jesus, Jesus has tasked you with proclaiming the life-changing power of God to people who are headed for disaster. Let that soak in for a minute. People are headed for disaster. 
Because without Jesus, there is no hope for eternal life. Let me say it again. Without Jesus Christ, there is no hope for eternal life. And that's not Chad's opinion. I'm not sharing with that with you because it's my opinion. I'm sharing that with you because it's what Jesus said. And if you're a follower of Jesus, what he says ought to be important. John chapter 3, verse 18. A lot of you know John 3, 16, or at least you know the reference. But do you know what John, that, that, that Jesus continues that conversation way past verse 16? In verse 18, he says, Whoever believes in him, the Son of God, is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. If you believe in Jesus, you're not condemned. But if you don't believe in him, you're already condemned. John 3, 36. By the way, just go home and read John 3 today, or this, sometime this week. Just look, meditate on it. John 3, Jesus says, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. If you have Jesus, you have forgiveness of sin, you have eternal life, but if you don't have Jesus, you're in a desperate place because you have no hope of eternal life without him. That, that's just... The, the truth. And so understand in our community, there are about 40,000 unchurched people. Okay? It's a rough number. Some of those people, I'm sure, know Jesus. But a lot of them don't. A lot of them don't. And they are our friends. They're our family. They're our co workers. They're our neighbors. They're the parents and families of the, that our kids go to school with and play sports with. They're the servers in the restaurants and the clerks in the stores and the, the people in the medical offices and the first responders that take care of us. They're, they're all around us. And God has called us. When I say us, I mean he's called you and he's called me. This is not a preacher thing. This is an us thing. This is a follower of Jesus thing. He's called us to simply share the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. To let people know that God has the power to redeem any life. Even those who were the last people you'd ever think to see in church. So here's my conviction. When we believe in God's power, we act. When we believe in God's power, we act. When we know that God's life-changing power is real. If you know that God's life-changing power is real in your life. When, when you know that you've experienced the forgiveness of sins and, and that that you have eternal life, you cannot help but act on it. And so when you know that, you just naturally invite your unchurched friends to church. You, you naturally just kind of tell your story of how Jesus changed you, what he means to you. And, and you just live a joyful, grateful life of integrity who freely shares and serves your neighbors. But when we believe that God really can redeem anybody, we act on it. Now, depending on which statistics you want to read or believe, somewhere between 65 and 95% of churches in America are struggling. That means they're plateaued or they're declining. They're not, they're not reaching people. They're not seeing life change happen on a regular basis. And, and, the, and the sad thing is they're filled with people who say that they believe in the power of God. They just aren't acting on it. And I've been in these churches. I've served in these churches. I, they're filled with people who love Jesus and they want to see people following Jesus and they're doing the best they can to follow Jesus. But somewhere along the way, pastors and, and attenders have stopped believing in the power of God to change lives. Now understand, they, they would never confess that. They, they, with their mouths, they, they would tell you they believe that God has the power to save anybody, to redeem anybody, to change anybody's life. They would, they would say that and they, and they believe it, they just don't live it. It's kind of like that whole repentance thing. You feel one way, but you live a different way. It's not about how you feel, it's about how you act. And, and, and if I ask you, everyone in this room would say, yes, we, we believe that God has the power to change lives. And it's easy to say, but it's different to act on it. So I believe that God is in the life-changing business right here in Lake Havasu City. And I believe that God will use any church and any follower of Jesus who believes in his power to redeem anybody in this community. 
So do you believe that God has the power to change lives? Do you guys want to see miracles happen? Okay, well then, uh, I'm going to challenge you to do three things. Not just feel three things, I'm going to ask you to do three things. Three th- and, and starting like this week, do these three things. And, and, and that's not like do them just for one week and stop. But, but this is a challenge is ongoing because if we really believe it, let's actually, you know, not just say it, let's actually live it. And, and these are not like really crazy, difficult things. Uh, they're just things that we need to do that we just don't think about doing and stuff like that. So here we go. The first one is invite. I mean, invite your friends to church, your unchurched friends to church. A lot of you are really good about inviting your church friends to church, but they already got a church, so stop it, Okay. <laughs> Uh, honestly, can I just be honest? If your friends are going to church and they know Jesus, then they're already in. They're going to heaven. You guys can hang out there. All right? Right? That, that's, that, that, that's what Jesus said. You know, so we, you know, when I talk about inviting people, I'm talking about your friends that are far from God. Your friends are the last people that you'd ever think to see in church because if we believe in God's power to change lives, let's, let's see what happens. And we're trying to make it really easy, and so we've got these invite cards for you. And here's what I want you to do. We're probably going to run out at, at some point this weekend, and, and praise God for that. I want everyone to take four of these cards. Why four? One's for you because we all forget the times, right? Uh, what time is that? Oh, yeah, you can read it. It's got the Passion Experience on one side, March 23rd, 24th, 25th. It's got the Easter services on the other side because we're doing an extra service on Saturday that I just invited half of you to come to. Um, and, and, and then one for you and three for your three unchurched friends that you're going to invite. That you're going to intentionally invite them. You're going to say, hey, I want you to come with me. Uh, trust me on this. It's going to be, you know, so just, you know, whether it's the passion experience, Easter, both, doesn't matter. We just want to make it easy for you to do this and, and to count it down and say, I'll gather Now, by the way, you are perfectly okay with me if you invite more than three friends. Okay, I'm sure God's happy with you too if you do that. But here's the plan. The plan is that... Uh, because we got about 2,000 people coming on a weekend, that uh, we invite 6,000 unchurched people to church in the next couple of weeks. You think about that. Think about what God can do. If we want to see miracles, then we've got to act on it. We've got to, you know, believe it, not just say we believe it, and then do nothing. So we're trying to help you do something tangible to serve God. God's, and, you, and you act in obedience, guess what? You're going to feel better when you do that too. Um, because you're obeying Jesus. By the way, Jesus didn't say, if you love me, sing enthusiastically and raise your hands in worship. He said, if you love me, obey me. So invite three friends. Okay, that's number one. That's a challenge. Number two, share your story. Share your story. Yeah, and by the way, when I say share your story, I'm not talking about to some stranger or someplace, uh, you know. I'm talking about to your friends or your family because they may not know how God has changed your life because you have an amazing story of life change. You have an amazing story of how God has taken you from who you were to who you are today, and he's worked in your life, and he's, he's given you hope, and he's changed who you are. Because if he hasn't done that, let's go back to that point again about God can change anybody. you sure he's done that? You have a story, and, and here's what happens. We don't tell that story very often, and so tell that story with your family, with your friends. You go, I don't know how to tell the story. Great. Talk to one of the pastors here and, you know, let us take you to lunch and hear your story and we'll help you to to figure out how to tell the good news that God has changed your life. But but sit down, start with your spouse and just, you know, guys, take turns sharing the story. What has God done in your life? How do you define that? How do you explain that? Because your story is your story and your story is amazing. Because it is your story. You go, but I don't have any of the cool elements. Like I didn't go to prison and sell drugs and do all this kind of, okay. I don't have a cool story either, but you know what? I am who I am because of Jesus Christ. And I know what a loser I am without him. And I, and, and, and I understand the power of God in me. And I understand how he's redeemed my life. And you may not see it. You may not even believe it. But I can share that with you. And your story is powerful. Because it's God at work in you. So don't discount it. It's, it's a beautiful, amazing picture of God's redemption. So invite three of your friends, share your story with someone. I, I just think your, your spouse, your kids, your grandkids, great place to begin. Pass down that spiritual heritage. And then third, bless people. Bless the people of Lake Havasu City. This is where we live. So let's bless the people of Lake Havasu. Bless them with your attitude. You know, scripture tells us to have the same attitude as Jesus so bless people with your attitude, 
which means, let's just begin by, how about trying this? Smile. <laughs> Smile at people. I mean, no one is ever going to be convinced to follow Jesus by angry, arrogant, grumpy people. You know what I'm saying? So try smiling. Try, try just having an attitude towards people that, that is, you know, encouraging. And, and, and I don't know why, as followers of Jesus, we would struggle with this anyway. I mean, come on. We know that we deserve hell, and yet we get to go to heaven. We know that we're going to trade in these broken down old bodies for brand new ones that never get sick, never get old, never hurt, never die. We know that Jesus loves us enough that he gave himself for us, and now we're sons and daughters of God. We know all this stuff, so why in the world isn't your face showing it? I mean, come on. The fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, joy, <laughs> peace, patience, kindness, goodness. Come on, can we not grasp this a little bit? And, and don't tell me about how bad the world is. The world's been bad since we messed it up, you know, way back in the garden because we didn't do what God asked us to do. So, yes, the world is bad, but yet we win. You win. Why in the world don't you smile about it sometime? I mean, come on, just, just that's the thing. Think, think, yeah, the world's going to hell in a handbasket, and I win. <laughs> Can't lose. You, you know, we ought to be the ones smiling like idiots while everybody else is panicking. Because Jesus is King of kings, Lord of lords, and we're on his side, and he's on ours. So, you know, ha bless people with your attitude, and bless people with your words. With your words. I mean, the things you say. I mean, start at home, okay? Try it at home out first, because they'll really appreciate it if you bless them with your words. I mean, Scripture tells us to bless those who persecute us. Bless and do not curse. And if we're supposed to bless the people who are our enemies, then by all means, we ought to be blessing the people who are our friends and our family. Just, just try that out. Try the blessing stuff out. Bless the, the servers in the restaurants. Bless the, the people that, you know, help you in the stores. Bless people, your, your neighbors. Just, you know, just after all, oh, think about this. We're supposed to love our neighbor as ourself, and love is patient, and love is kind. Yeah, so if we're not blessing people, we're, we're really going to not be representing Jesus. So they're not going to, you know, come to church with us, you know, because I don't really want you going out there, hey, you're a jerk, but I want you to come to church with me. <laughs> yeah. It's not going to work real well. It's really not. So bless people with your attitude. Bless people with your words. Bless people by serving the community with the joy of Christ. I mean, come on. This is our community. So we serve this community. We want... We want to make it better because we want people to know Jesus. We want to know that, that God loves them and that we love them. We want to bless this community because it's our community. We live here, so let's make it a better place. So there's your challenge. Invite three of your unchurched friends uh, to church. Share your story with someone and bless the people of Lake Havasu starting in your household. See, I think you can do that. I know you can do that. I know that we can do that. And see, here's the thing. I know that right now, probably most of us have the intention of doing that. But I don't want this to be a weeping at the altar moment where we have good intentions and we walk out and we go right back to our life. Because words are easy. But our actions demonstrate our repentance. Our actions demonstrate what we believe and how God has changed our life. I believe that God has the power to redeem anyone. He's in the business of life change. We're his servants, his employees, if you, if you want, if that works for you. So are you going to be a reluctant and unenthusiastic servant like Jonah? Or are you going to be excited to be an important part of God's kingdom and God's mission? Um, choice is yours. I know which one I'm going to choose because I know how God has changed my life. Let's pray.